Doctrine and Covenants 68 is a two-part revelation received by Joseph Smith on November 1st amidst a conference held at the Johnson Farm at Hiram, Ohio. Part 1 is directed to four elders specifically, while Part 2 is directed toward the whole church generally. Here's the backstory. On the 1st and 2nd of November, 1831, ten elders gathered for a conference in Hiram, Ohio at the John Johnson Farm to discuss the publication of Joseph Smith's revelations. Four of those elders, Orson Hyde, the brothers Luke and Lyman Johnson, and William E. McClellan, approached Joseph on the first day of this conference and, the prophet's history states, were desirous to know the mind of the Lord concerning themselves. So, Joseph said, I inquired and received section 68. What's interesting to note about this 35-verse revelation is that only verses 1 through 12 specifically address these four elders and their question, concluding in verse 12 with an Amen. Then, from verse 13 onward, there is an abrupt shift in both the audience being addressed and the subject matter of the revelation. For this reason, some believe that this section may have originally been two separate revelations, which, like some other revelations, were later combined into one DNC section due to their shared context or themes. But because no original manuscripts of this section exist, and our earliest versions always contain both parts as one revelation, we cannot confirm this. But what seems clear is that the sudden shift in both audience and subject at verse 13 strongly indicates that there was a second backstory with a separate set of questions which has been lost to us. Yet given the contextual clues available to us, we might hazard a guess as to the general issue of this lost backstory. Given the fact, for instance, that verse 13 references items in addition to the covenants and commandments, and given the fact that section 20 was sometimes called the covenants and church articles, and that our earliest manuscript here said laws and commandments, referring to DNC 42, and given the fact that what follows in verses 14 to 35 is a description of the calling of church bishops and an added law for parents in Zion, and given the facts that a major purpose of DNC 42 was to outline the duties of the bishop, and that a major purpose of DNC 20 was to outline the duties of church members, it is reasonable to conclude that the major issue in this lost backstory was the need to add regulatory instruction beyond sections 20 and 42 based on the growing needs of the church. But, of course, without better historical documentation, we can't know the particulars for sure. So that's the backstory, as far as we have it. Now let's look at the details of both parts of the Lord's instruction here. In the first part of this revelation, responding to the four inquiring elders, the Lord begins by addressing my servant Orson Hyde, who had just been baptized and ordained an elder the previous month at age 26. He explains that Orson was called by his ordination to proclaim the everlasting gospel by the Spirit of the living God, from people to people, and from land to land, and in the congregations of the wicked, in their synagogues, a term here being used generically as a place of worship, and reasoning with and expounding all scriptures unto them. And behold and lo, the Lord says, this is an ensample, meaning a pattern or model, unto all those who were ordained unto this priesthood, whose mission is appointed unto them to go forth. Specifically, he clarifies in verse 3, the pattern these elders are to follow is that they shall speak as they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And whatsoever they shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, he promises remarkably, shall be scripture, shall be the will of the Lord, shall be the mind of the Lord, shall be the word of the Lord, shall be the voice of the Lord, and the power of God unto salvation. In this stunning promise, the Lord uniquely defines scripture as that which is spoken when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. In Joseph's day, as in ours, the dictionary meaning of Scripture is that which was written, or sacred writings, and usually carries the connotation of mostly ancient texts. Here, however, the Lord directly challenges that paradigm, declaring that even the newest converts, like Orson Hyde, can be spirit-guided to speak fresh Scripture, representing the Lord's own will, mind, and word. The Book of Mormon prophet Alma adds that God imparts His word to not only men, but women also. And this is not all, he says. Little children do have words given unto them many times, which confound the wise and the learned. And Nephi emphasizes that anyone who receives the Holy Ghost can speak with the tongue of angels by the power of the Holy Ghost, which means they can speak the words of Christ. This is precisely what the Lord is affirming here in these verses to these four young converts recently ordained to preach. Behold, he says in verse 5, This is the promise of the Lord unto you, O ye my servants. Wherefore, be of good cheer. And do not fear, for I the Lord am with you, and will stand by you. And ye shall bear record of me, even Jesus Christ, that I am the Son of the living God, that I was, that I am, 
and that I am to come. This is the word of the Lord not only to Orson, Luke, Lyman, and William, but also unto all the faithful elders of my church. To all such, he says, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, acting in the authority which I have given you, baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And then promises that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned, and he that believeth shall be blessed with signs following, even as it is written. He also promised his servants that unto you it shall be given to know the signs of the times, and the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. And of as many as the Father shall bear record, he said, to you shall be given power to seal them up unto eternal life, a privilege which Joseph taught the previous week, belonged to those of the high priesthood. The Amen here at the end of verse 12 marks the end of the Lord's response to these four men. Verses 13 to 35 now go on to address the church generally. And now verse 13 transitions. Concerning the items in addition to the covenants and commandments, they are these. Again, the covenants here almost certainly refers to DNC 20, and commandments refers to the law in DNC 42 specifically, and perhaps the various other revelations generally. He announces that, in the due time of the Lord, other bishops are to be set apart unto the church to minister even according to the first, which was Edward Partridge, the one and only presiding bishop in the church at the time. He explains that these additional presiding bishops must be high priests who are worthy, who are appointed by the first presidency of the Melchizedek priesthood. In the 1835 edition of this section, Joseph added what might be referred to as the literal descendants of Aaron exception clause to this rule, which spans from the end of verse 15 to verse 21. This exception clause is essentially that presiding bishops must be high priests, except they be literal descendants of Aaron. That is, if they be literal descendants of Aaron, they have a legal right to the bishopric, specifically if they are the firstborn among the sons of Aaron, because the firstborn holds the right of the presidency over this priesthood, and the keys or authority of the same. No one else has a legal right to this office. But since a high priest of the Melchizedek priesthood has authority to officiate in all the lesser offices, he may officiate in the office of bishop when no literal descendant of Aaron can be found. Yet even if a man is a literal descendant of Aaron, he clarifies, he can only officiate in this office if he is ordained under the hands of the first presidency to do so. Now, what, if any, circumstance prompted this exception clause to be later inserted here is not known. And as far as we know, no firstborn literal descendants of Aaron have yet filled the office of presiding bishop in the church. Verses 22 to 24 then briefly explain that only the first presidency can take church disciplinary action against a presiding bishop. Verses 25 to 30 transition to the topic of the duty of parents toward their children in Zion or in any of her stakes which are organized. The Lord begins by warning that parents who don't teach their children to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of the hands, what the Lord has previously referred to collectively as the fullness of my gospel and mine everlasting covenant, when eight years old, the sin be upon the heads of the parents, and this shall be a law unto the inhabitants of Zion, or in any of her stakes which are organized. Now, the logic behind this law of parenting seems to be this. By teaching them to understand this core doctrine, parents give their sons and daughters the optimal opportunity to choose to become the children of Christ and heirs in His kingdom through the everlasting covenant. And by failing to teach them to understand this doctrine, parents are actually impairing their children's ability to choose Christ and His kingdom. And for this impairment, the Lord is saying, parents will be held accountable. Now, of course, teaching children to understand the doctrine of the fullness of the gospel will in no way guarantee that they will choose to receive it, but it will guarantee that they have the choice to do so. Parents are thus never to force gospel compliance upon their children, but are rather to enable them to choose Christ by teaching them to understand this fundamental doctrine in verse 25. And after having thus been taught, their children shall be baptized for the remission of their sins when eight years old, and receive the laying on of the hands. This is the one and only verse in Scripture that mentions eight years old as the earliest age for baptism. Previous revelations had authorized baptism for those who had arrived at the age of accountability, but had not delineated precisely what that age was. Then, in his Bible translation work in Genesis 17 earlier that year, Joseph learned that children are not accountable before me until they are eight years old. And now here, for the first time, these two ideas are explicitly joined together. The Lord continues, saying that parents shall also teach their children to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord. 
And both parents and children shall also observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And those who are appointed to labor should do so in all faithfulness, for the idler shall be had in remembrance before the Lord. Now the reason the Lord is mentioning each of these items he discloses in verse 31 is because I the Lord am not well pleased with the inhabitants of Zion, that is church members in Missouri. For there are idlers among them, and their children are also growing up in wickedness. They also seek not earnestly the riches of eternity, but their eyes are full of greediness. These things ought not to be, he says, and must be done away from among them. Wherefore, let my servant Oliver Cowdery carry these sayings unto the land of Zion. That is, Oliver is to personally deliver the Lord's words in D&C 68 to Missouri church members. He adds a final cautionary commandment to those in Missouri, saying, that he that observeth not his prayers before the Lord in the season thereof is to be had in remembrance before the judge of my people, Edward Partridge. These sayings are true and faithful, he testifies. Wherefore, transgress them not, neither take therefrom. Behold, I am Alpha and Omega, and I come quickly. Amen. So, we can summarize the key contributions of Doctrine and Covenant 68 this way. First, it expanded the meaning of the term Scripture and broadened our understanding of who can speak it, which is, anyone speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. Second, it forecasted an imminent organizational expansion in the number of presiding bishops and provided further details about who can serve in that position and their accountability to the First Presidency. Third, it added an additional law to parents in the church to teach their children to understand the doctrine of the fullness of the gospel, to pray, and to walk uprightly before the Lord. And fourth, it contained a rebuke to church members in Missouri regarding their idleness, wickedness, and greed, together with a stern commandment for them to regularly pray before the Lord. And that's the story of Doctrine and Covenant 68. 